Isaiah chapter 52 for a few moments tonight. A little continuation from Sunday night. Isaiah chapter 52. The church is in bad shape in this, this time period. But God's promising to help them. That's encouraging, isn't it? When we're going through things individually or as a church, when God sends a promise that he's going to help us, that's an encouraging thing. And God told the Israelites through the prophet Isaiah that he was going to help them. But in the meantime, he also told them to do some things. And we spoke to you uh, from verses 1 and 2. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Under bondage. Church is in a sad state. Israel was intended to be what you would call a theocracy. Not a democracy, not communist. Theo means God, ruled by God himself. You know, for a long time they didn't have any king. God was their king. And then they decided they needed a king so they'd be like everybody else. Big, big mistake. God intended to be their king, intended to be their leader, wanted to be the one in charge, wanted to be the one helping them make the decisions, wanted to be the one helping them get through their troubles. God wanted to be in charge of his Old Testament church, the Jewish, Israel. Well, he is in charge of his New Testament church. And he wants to be in charge. He wants to be in control. And as we tried to speak to you Sunday night, if we're going to awake... One of the things we're going to have to do is get back and putting the preeminence on the Word of God. There's no substitute for the Word. There is no substitute for the Bible. And I preached long enough on that. I'm not going to labor that again tonight. But there is another element that I think we really need to zero in on in this dispensation that they didn't have the privilege that we have but God sent another comforter after Christ was taken back to heaven. The Holy Spirit of God was sent down to dwell in and, and with the church, to be a comforter, to be a guide. And the Spirit-filled, Spirit-led early church did phenomenal things. Right? You read the book of Acts? 3,000 saved one day, 5,000 saved another day. People raised from the dead, people were healed from all manner of diseases. I mean, it's like reading a mighty powerful biography of a great revival. It was a great revival, but it was related to the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the New Testament church. And I believe if we're going to awake and if we're going to put on our strength, we're going to have to put him on. We're going to have to get back to cultivating a, a walk with God that includes a communion with the Holy Spirit and a, uh, and a surrendering of ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit of God so that he can possess us and use us. Now the devil will possess his people without their permission. The devil just takes charge of people because they open certain channels that allows him to go in. And he doesn't care. He's a hard taskmaster. But God doesn't work that way. You have to invite him. You have to want him. You have to welcome him. But he wants to live in you and dwell in you. And the Spirit be able to, to minister through you. There's so much that the Spirit does. In fact, everything, everything that the New Testament believer receives from God in our time, comes through the agency and working of the Holy Spirit. Everything. You can start with conviction. Is conviction necessary? Or can people get saved on a whim? 
I don't believe that, friend. I don't believe that you can get saved on a whim. The Spirit has to work on our hearts and draw us to God and to help us to feel the weight of our sin. That's what conviction does. It helps us to feel the weight of our guilt and our sin so that we can truly tell God we're sorry. Now, parents make children lie a lot of times. I don't agree with this. Tell your brother you're sorry. I'm sorry. As he grits his teeth at her as mama's not looking. Was he sorry? He obeyed the command. But friend, it's going to take more than that to get right with God. We're not just utter something flippantly. It's, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. That's not getting sick of our sin to the point that we're ready to give it up and ready to turn from it and ready to walk God's way and do it His way. Repentance is very essential to salvation and repentance relies on the Spirit of God convicting us of our need of repentance. So the Holy Spirit, even before you're saved, he has to be working in your life to get saved. There's conviction. The church, uh, you know, is energized. The dynamic, the dynamo that's in the New Testament body of Christ, the power that's in the body of Christ is through the Spirit. Even the Old Testament prophet said, it's not by works, it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The proverb has said, the laborer laboreth in vain, except the Lord build the house. The watchman waketh but in vain, except the Lord keep the city. Friend, if the Holy Spirit's not working in the church, energizing the church, it's all human effort. That'll never cut it. It'll never cut it. We've reduced ourselves to just a social order. We're just another little fraternity. We meet on certain days and we go through certain forms and we say our prayers and we sing our songs and we go home and the Spirit is never manifest. Friend, we have to contend for better than that. We know better than that. The wholeness movement knows better than that. If you've been any length of time in the kingdom, you've heard and been in camp meetings and been in revivals where the glory of God settled down on the church and what happened? The saints were blessed. How many times do you hear people talking about the blessing today? Friend, we dare not be content without the manifestation and the working of the Holy Spirit in our midst. This is something we must contend for. This is something we must agonize before God. Lord, we need your presence. It doesn't matter who the preacher is. If God doesn't show up, it's dead. He may be a great orator. He may be able to tell great stories and move your emotions. But if the Holy Ghost is not taking what the preacher says and anointing it, it doesn't last any longer till you get home. You've done for God at all. What I'm trying to say is, O oh Zion, we need to put on our strength. The Holy Spirit is our strength. He's the one that fortifies us and strengthens us. And he will help us to overcome if we'll rely on him and cultivate that, that spiritual, sanctified, spirit-filled walk with God that we need in this hour. It's very important that the church is energized by the Spirit and not just by human effort and human talent and charisma. And God forbid, like some of the false prophets, it's energized by demonic spirits. There are churches that are lively, but it's the spirit of the devil that's enlivening it. But we need the real thing, don't we? We want the real thing. We want the Holy Spirit to have right of way. We want him to come. We need to welcome him. We need to entreat him to come. We need to welcome him into our devotions. We need to welcome him into our services, into our Sunday schools, into our whatever. 
where, me, where we're meeting for spiritual reasons, he needs to be in the preeminent. The Holy Spirit. He's the energizer. He's the illuminator. Where do you get your understanding from? Well, I have a degree from so-and-so. Hoopla. The Bible is a book of divine revelation. It's not an academic book. It's a book where God reveals his truth to honest seekers. And the Holy Spirit, it said when he has come, he will guide you into all truth. In other words, he's going to make this book come alive to you. He's going to make this book intelligible to you. You're going to be able to understand, not all of it, you won't understand all of it. Probably not in this life. But you'll understand what he wants you to understand. Don't worry about what you don't know. Worry about what you do know. Walk in the light you do have. And keep walking in it. But the Holy Spirit wants to illuminate the scriptures. He wants to bring the scriptures to light. He wants to bring truth to your heart and mind when you need it most, when you're in the battle, when you're discouraged, when the enemy's bombarding you. He needs to bring truth to your heart and illuminate the Bible so that you can draw strength from the Word of God. Are we relying on Him? There's two tendencies when the battle gets hot. One is to go away and draw back, not come to church. The other is flee, Flee to Christ. That'd be the wise thing to do. When the battle's on, run to church. If you feel like you have a need, run to the altar. Gather your brothers and sisters around you and let them pray fervently for you that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you with might in the inward person that you might be victorious. When we draw back and isolate ourselves, the devil's got a bigger advantage. I want you to know that. So if you're going to run, run toward him. Because he is the energizer. He is the illuminator. He's the blessed comforter. He's the guide. He's the purifier. He's the anointer. <laughs> if you have a responsibility of singing a song, teaching a class, preaching a sermon, how much we need his anointing tonight. How much I need his anointing. I need him to take what I say and give it authority and unction. Unction means weight. Give it a weightiness that when you hear it, it's going to hit you. And it's going to affect you. What did it say in the day of Pentecost when, preach, when Peter was preaching his little sermon from Joel? He said, oh, our hearts were pricked. They were struck with the anointing of the words of this plain fisherman. He, he had such an anointing on him that day of the Holy Ghost that thousands of people were crying out, what must we do? Wouldn't you like to see that? Even just one person cry, what do I need to do, preacher? Help me to get right with God. I feel it in my heart. I've been touched by God. I need God to help me. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see some of that? We won't unless we ask for it. We won't unless we want it. We won't unless we get him on the scene in power. Friends, the Holy Spirit is where our strength is. The church that operates by the working of the Spirit is a growing church, it's a vibrant church, it's a healthy church, it's a loving church, it's an illuminated church, it's a church that's separated from the world and walking in the light of God's holy commandments. It's a church that's on fire for God. I want that holy fire. I contend for it. Are you contending for the fire? One of the emblems of the Holy Spirit is fire and it's set on the heads of those uh, apostles and 120 disciples on that glorious day of Pentecost there was a, a flame of fire that just seemed to, to set on their head the Holy Spirit embolized himself as a flame of fire he's a purifier friend he wants to purify his church again he wants to empower his church again he wants to illuminate his church again 
He wants to give his people joy again. He wants to bless us again. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. <laughs> Do you believe that? Yeah. Well, God blesses me because I have plenty of food. There's a lot of people don't know a thing about grace has plenty of food. No, I believe in thanking God for your food. I do every day. Usually in the morning, I thank him for the house I have to live in. I thank him for the clothes I have to wear. I thank him for the food in the cupboards. I thank him for a vehicle that runs in the driveway. I go down the list of those ordinary things that sometimes we take for granted. Lord, I thank you for those things. But there's a whole bunch of my neighbors that's got every bit of that that I do, and they don't know a thing about God. Now, I believe God blesses his people and meets their needs. But I believe there's a deeper blessing. I believe there's a spiritual blessing where he comes down and manifests himself to you and me. And that blessing just thrills our heart. Remember the old song, All that thrills my soul is Jesus? You know, that's what we need. We need a new thrill. Not a, we need a new thrill from the old source. Not something new to catch our fancy, some passing trend. We don't need that. We need to get back to the book. The spirit of the living God is the agent of this dispensation. He's looking to find people to, in, to feel and to nurture and to bless and to encourage and to teach. He's looking for people that he can minister to and mold into what he wants them to be as Christians. The blessing of the Lord not only makes rich, but the blessing of the Lord brings joy. And you know what the Bible says about joy. The joy of the Lord is your, say it out loud for me, strength. So if I'm beat down all the time, if I'm in the mully grubs all the time, do I give the appearance of spiritual strength or not? And I know we can't help going through valleys, friends. I'm not saying this is all a mountaintop experience. It is not, okay? So don't let the devil beat you up if you're in the valley tonight. But I don't want to live in the valley. I want to live on the mountaintop. I want to live under the blessing of God. I want to live under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I want him to be my teacher. I want him to be my guide. I want him to be the power in my life that gives me the victory over everything the devil throws at me. Amen? Do you believe he can? I believe he can. I believe he wants to. <laughs> I believe he has the power tonight to enable his church in this day with all the ungodliness, with all the insanity, with all the perversion, with all the wickedness, with all the deceitfulness that's going on around us tonight, God is able to give his church victory and strength. Amen. I think the little paper was passed out. Must have been. I saw one in the pew and Brother Robert gave me one about this move to change our children and influence them to change their genders at seven and eight years of age. and Parents no longer have a right to say what's best for your children. Friend, I want to tell you, and you young people here tonight, you want to get a good dose of old time salvation. You want to get a powerful infilling of the Holy Ghost because you're going to face some things. I, we faced some things in my generation. We've dealt with some things from the government and society. But I want to tell you, friend, it's going to be times 10 in the next few years if God doesn't do something in the way of revival for America. But I want to tell you tonight, it used to be, and I'll just, I'll just some of the things that when I first started pastoring, some of the things were, you know, that when our ladies would take a job in the secular world, they wanted to enforce a dress code that we did not believe in and we had to take a stand. There was the issue of Sunday work and we had to take a stand. There have been issues where the culture has tried to press us into its mold. 
But those of us who read the Bible and are solidly built upon the foundation of the Word of God, there's some things that are non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. I got saved on a Saturday night, and I, I was a, a very avid worker for my employer. One time, I worked over 30 days without a single day off. I was greedy. I liked the money. You know, I like making good money. I like spending good money, just like every sinner does. I like that. And so I'd work all I could. But I got saved on a Saturday night with very, very little background from church. Very little. But the Holy Ghost told me to go tell my employer on Monday morning, I can't work any more Sundays. U.S. Steel has a seven-day work policy. You can be fired for not working Sunday. He didn't fire me. God kept me my job as long as he wanted me there. And then he put me into full-time ministry. But friend, I want to tell you, there's some things you can get settled. There's things you must get settled. And if you're going to get it settled, you're going to get it settled by the indwelling presence and help and illumination of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord. Amen. You're going to need him to make these convictions rock solid. Make these biblical principles and commandments rock solid. And give you the power and the joy to look them in the eye. Let it be known, O king, we're not bowing to your idols. <laughs> Whether he delivers us or not, we're still not bowing. I like that. Amen. God's able to empower us to do that. God has empowered his people down through the centuries to face all sorts of brutal persecution and still maintain their testimony and not change their, their word, their testimony, their convictions. Amen. I want to be like that. And I realize I can only be like that as he enables me. I can't do it myself. Hatfields are hard-headed, I'll grant you that. Okay, we are. But none of us are a match for the devil without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So if Zion is going to put on its power tonight, it's going to get back to the word and know what the Bible teaches and follow those commandments. Whatever Jesus said unto you, you ought to be doing it. You ought to be obeying him. And once you get those things settled in your heart and you're living for Christ, then, friend, you can look uh, you, can, you, you can just look the world in the eye and say, I ain't doing that. I'm not going there. If it costs me my job, if it costs me my freedom, if it costs me friendships, and it does, all three of those things, it can be expensive to serve God. Ask the disciples. All of them but one were martyred. Eleven of them were martyred. They went to their grave at the hands of a, a persecutor. But sudden death was what? Sudden glory. The battle was over. This earth was left behind. They appeared in the presence of Jesus and to live with him forevermore. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord in this dispensation. It wasn't so in the Old Testament. They went to Abraham's bosom, but that's another message. But the church is purified, it's anointed, it's blessed, it's convicted, it's taught. Everything we need to grow and mature in Christ, everything we need to overcome the enemy, the Holy Spirit has it. He's your answer. So if you're not sanctified tonight, you shouldn't be waiting any longer. You need the, the Pentecostal experience of being filled with the Spirit. You need that cleansing, but you also need that power. God can't give you the power as long as the inside wants to do its own way. But once your heart is fully cleansed from inbred sin, and your will is totally surrendered to Jesus Christ, the Spirit can take you and use you and mold you and fill you and bless you. 
I want his blessings. I want, it. I want to be like Jabez. Bless me, Lord. Bless me. Simple prayer, wasn't it? Bless me. Do you ever pray for the Lord to bless you? Oh, I pray that the Lord will bless you. I hope he blesses you so good you can't sit in your seat. You ever seen anybody blessed so good they couldn't sit still? I've seen dignified women in the church with offering plates on their head walking around the church. They were blessed out of themselves. I've seen people running in the aisles. I've seen people shouting. Little old ladies walking around with their hanky, praising God. Oh, friend, we need a blessing. It's not all in the demonstration, but it's certainly not all in deadness, is it? It's not all in shouting, but I'd like to see some. Wouldn't mind doing some. I'm not ashamed to shout for the Lord. I may have told you this when I was here, but we preacher boys were down in Nashville doing our, our college work. We were down there for a, what they'd call now a block class, I guess. But uh, we were down there, and uh, we were sleeping in the school on the floor. Uh, that week we were there doing that class, and we'd go over in the mornings to a little store. And it opened, I think, about 7 or 8 o'clock. We were over there to get us a, a Twinkie and a pint of milk or whatever we were going to have for breakfast that morning. Nice, nutritious breakfast probably. But uh, we went over there, and we were four or five of us, and there's a group of people gathered around. And Man, that was a vulgar, vulgar group, and they, they just took God's name in vain. and They were just talking awful. Well, one of the ministerial brethren got, he, he got, it just got under him real bad. And he had a booming voice. And he reared back his head and he said, Praise God! Glory to God! You talking about a crowd getting quiet. You talking about a crowd shutting up. They didn't cuss no more in our presence. I mean, you know, sometimes we just need to let our let our position be known. Let our, our place be known. This world is not a home. It belongs to them. They can have it when we're done with it. When we're gone, they can have everything here. But I want you to know, friend, while we're here, we need to be light and salt. We need to let the Spirit guide us and direct us so that we can impact, so that we can witness, so that we can preach and teach and sing and pray and do missionary work. Friend, it's going to take him to do any of that worthwhile. Amen? Amen. You can pray and thank God for everybody that prays. And we can, we can go through the motions, but God help us not to do that. I don't want to go through the motions of this thing. I want life in me to manifest itself so that others can see there's life in me. I'm alive. He that hath the Son hath life. That's the word of God, John, 1 John. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. They're dead. You wouldn't expect them to shout. You wouldn't expect them to testify. You wouldn't expect them to pray out loud. You wouldn't expect them to sing heartily to the Lord in worship. Now, I try to cut mine back because it sounds so bad. But some of you all don't need to do that. Y'all can just sing it to all you got. It sounds good. But if Zion's going to put on her strength in this day, she's going to have to take a trip back to Pentecost. Whether it's a second infilling, whether it's an initial infilling, whether it's just a renewing and a reviving, a stirring. Folks, we need to get before the Holy Spirit and ask Him to bless us. Ask Him to anoint us. Ask Him to guide us. Ask Him to illuminate us. Ask Him to reprove us if we need it. Ask Him to, to do those things that He is sent here to do and do it in me, Lord. Do it for me. If no one else wants it, I'll take all of it. I want everything he can give me. 
I want all He can tell me. I want to walk in all the light He has for me. Amen. Do you see the need of power? Do you see the, the need of the church in this hour that's kind of beat down and dwindling and, and suffering in so many ways, so many ways suffering? It's time we call out to God, Lord, awaken us to our need of a Holy Ghost infilling. Spirit-filled Christian. Amen? I'm not beating on you tonight. I'm trying to challenge us. Folks, I realize that in the last days, all ten virgins were sleeping. And if that parable means what we think it means, that's representative of the church. So all of us need to stir ourselves. Look at our condition. Look at our church's conditions. Look at our family's conditions. And if there ever was a time, we need the Holy Ghost to to empower us to live a life that's pleasing to God as a testimony to the world and to our family that there's something real about this thing. There's a lot of them that are making fun of it. There's a lot of them that are making light of it. There's a lot of people that grew up in our holiness churches that are fighting it today. Has everything been done just as it should have been done in all of our churches? Absolutely not. Have people made gross errors? Yes, they have. Have people committed tremendous blunders and people didn't deal with it properly? Yes, that's true, all true. But that doesn't change the reality of what Christ has done. You can look at what's wrong or you can look at the Lord and you can say like Polycarp, he's never done me no harm. How can I deny him now? You can follow those that want to find fault and look at the wrong, look at the negative, look at the hypocritical side. Jesus had 12 followers. One of them was a betrayer, a Judas Iscariot. But friends, while the church body in general is not perfect, the blood bought are. The blood bought are redeemed. Every sin's under the blood. And they're walking in the light as God gives them light. I'm glad tonight to be a Christian, aren't you? I'm glad we live in this day. I'm glad we have the comforter. I'm glad for what the Hebrew writer called an uttermost salvation. This will save you to the uttermost. It'll keep you to the uttermost. And one day... That'll turn into all eternity in heaven. So let's be challenged tonight to put on strength. So I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow, preacher. I'm going to get me a set of dumbbells, and I'm going to get stronger. Well, that might not hurt you any, but that's certainly not what I'm talking about. You can't find this at the gym. You find it in the closet. Your secret closet of prayer. Lord, help me. If you don't feel like you need any of this, would you pray the Lord will help this unworthy preacher? Because as I go from church to church and see struggling congregations all over the country, friends, we need a revival. Amen. And he's the only one can bring it. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can bring it. So let's cultivate whatever he wants. Deal with the areas. Let him deal with the areas he wants to deal with. Let him talk to you. I want him to talk to me. I want him to deal with me. I haven't made it, and you haven't made it. It's been a lot greater men than I have, than I am, that have fallen from grace. It's been a lot greater people than you are that's fallen from grace. We're going to stand, and we're going to stand only by the help and grace of God and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how we're going to make it. Amen. Well, we love you tonight. Thank God. You pray for my wife. She's been married 96 years today. 48 for her and 48 for me. We've been married 96 years today. 
First time in our married life we've ever been apart on our anniversary. So all the hankies over there are wet from our tears today, I'm sure. <laughs> Hadn't been that bad, but we do miss her. After 48 years, she kind of she kind of grows on you, you know. I hope I've grown on her. Andrew, quit that. I've grown, she's grown, we've all grown, so just a fact of life. Anyone have anything in your heart before we go? Anybody have anything on your heart? Pray about, testify about, confess. Then I assume you're ready to go home. Let's stand.